video is about internal energy and work. In other words, we're going to talk a little bit about what comprises the energy of a chemical system. So first we need to go back to the first law of thermodynamics and keep that in mind. And that first law is, of course, that energy is conserved. Energy is not created or destroyed. Now I want to give you just a little background information on work. Now this is some physics aspects of chemistry. So bear with me, and those of you that have had physics already, you'll probably understand this really well. So work is something that is done in moving objects against a force. Work is defined as force times distance. So systems, chemical systems, can actually do work on their surroundings, and they can have work done on them by their surroundings. So if a system does work, of course, energy is expended, just like if you did work, you would expend energy. And if energy is expended, then the energy of the system overall is going to go down. Interestingly enough, if the surroundings do work on the system, that means that the energy of the system is actually going to increase. Here I want to discuss what comprises the internal energy of a chemical system. The internal energy is the sum of all the potential and kinetic energies of all that makes up the system, and that includes atoms, molecules, and ions that might be in a chemical system. The potential energy in a chemical system, as we said before, is associated with those attractive and repulsive forces between all the nuclei of the atoms and the electrons that are in that chemical system. This includes bonds in molecules, forces between ions, and forces between molecules in the liquid and solid states, in other words, intermolecular forces, which we will talk about in Chapter 13. Kinetic energy, then, is the energy of motion, and it comprises the energy of motion of the atoms, molecules, and ions in the system. Now, here's the deal. You can imagine that all of these forces that are going on, the uh, attractive and repulsive forces, and the energy of motion of all the atoms, and we're talking about moles of atoms, so we're talking about a huge number of chemical species in a, in a chemical system. It's impossible for us to measure the value of the energy of a system, because there's so many interactions contributing to it, number one, and number two, it's dynamic. Those push and pull, those attractive and repulsive forces are changing from moment to moment. And so we really cannot measure at any given moment in time the energy of a system because there are just too many factors going into it. So energy, E, is typically measured in a constant volume system. So that means if you keep the volume constant, typically what changes is pressure. So but... We cannot measure the total energy of a system, but we can certainly measure any changes in energy. And we, cons we consider changes in energy to be delta E measured in a, volume, in, a, in a system at constant volume. On a previous slide, I described to you what work is in, tr in uh, physics terms. It's force times distance. So what does work look like in a chemical system? So one example is actually mechanical work done by expanding gases. This is called pressure volume work. And it's usually work that's associated with the change in volume of a chemical system. So for example, if you were to take a little piece of dry ice and put it in a sealed Ziploc bag, and then put that Ziploc bag underneath a book, for example, that's like laid open over the bag, and you allowed that dry ice to sublime, in other words, turn directly from a solid to a gas, can you imagine what would happen? Can you see what would happen? The gas would expand, the bag would expand, and it would actually push the book upwards. And so that's a perfect example of work done by a chemical system when gases expand. These, t these types of work occur against a resisting external pressure typically atmospheric pressure, but sometimes it could be the pressure of a book or something like that. So to expand a little bit on the carbon dioxide scenario, um, when we look at the change of carbon dioxide from a solid to a gas, that system has to be absorbing energy from the surroundings. So thermodynamics then focuses on the energy transfer 
in that process of that phase change of sublimation. So heat transferred to the carbon dioxide from the surrounding air. And the change in energy is related to the heat transferred to or from the system and also to the work done to or by the system. And these mathematical relationships follow suit. So the change in energy is equal to the sum of the heat transfer and the work. And then work is equated to the negative of the pressure times the change in the volume. And this comes basically from the ideal gas law and relationships within the ideal gas law. So W is work, P is pressure, and change delta V is change in volume. So you can imagine that if, in certain circumstances, if heat is transferred into the system and work is done by the system, you have opposing forces going on. So again, like I said before, we need to be really careful about our algebraic signs in this chapter and make sure that our positive and negatives are calculated correctly. This slide kind of summarizes those algebraic signs and their importance. So if you look at the first one, if heat is transferred to a system, that would be into a system, the Q is going to be greater than zero or positive, and the energy of the system increases. Conversely, if heat is transferred from a system, the Q is going to be less than zero or negative, and the energy of the system decreases. And then the same kind of thing applies to work. So if work is done on the system by the surroundings, the work value is going to be greater than zero or positive, and that results in an increase in the energy of the system. And then conversely, if work is done by the system, the work value is going to be less than zero or negative, and that means that energy is expended by the system, and the energy of that system is going to decrease as a result of that.